Uh, welcome, everyone, tonight um, for coming out. And uh, my name is David Van Zant. I'm the president here at the New School. And tonight's event really is a wonderful example of what the New School offers in its longstanding commitment to thinking about problems creatively and to being socially engaged in terms of in terms of society around us. It's also um, it's also uh, 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 programs like this that I think add a lot to our community, and I'm very proud that the New School is part of this. This particular uh, program is part of the Public Voices series, which was started last year by the Center for Public Scholarship um, here at the New School. This is the third event in the series. Um, it's a platform for distinguished public figures and scholars to address pressing issues uh, of the day. Our previous events included um, Senator Russ Feingold, who was in a conversation with Bob Carey about post-9-11 America. And then more recently, Steven Pinker and Robert J. Lifton discussed the topic on whether or not violence uh, is actually increased uh, in, or decreased in, in the modern world. And of course, tonight's event takes on uh, the subject of entitlements, which is an especially uh, important question in this time of austerity. But also, it's a very important question in terms of the election, because in some ways, in some ways, the two parties have presented that as a choice for the American people around the issue of entitlement. Um, let me introduce our speakers. Uh, first of all, Nicholas Eberstadt. He is the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute. He's also a senior advisor to the National Bureau of Asian Research, a member of the visiting committee at the Harvard School of Public Health, a member of the Global Leadership Council at the World Economic Forum. He's a political economist and a demographer uh, by training and researches and writes extensively on economic development, foreign aid, global health, demographics, and poverty. Uh, the author of numerous monographs and articles on North and South Korea, East Asia, and countries of the former uh, Soviet Union. His books include The End of North Korea, that was 1999. They're still there, right? I, they, yeah. Okay. No, sorry. <laughs> the poverty of the poverty of the poverty rate, uh, and then an, and then his most recent book that's the subject of tonight's debate: uh, A Nation of Takers: uh, Americans' Entitlement Epidemic. Now he has his a PhD from Harvard. Our second speaker is William Galston. He is the Ezra, uh, Ezra Zilka Chair in Governance Studies Program at the Brookings Institution, where he's also a senior fellow. He also doubles as a College Park professor at the University of Maryland. He's a former advisor to President Clinton and presidential candidates, an expert on domestic policy, political campaigns, and election. His current research focuses on designing a new social contract and the implications of political polarization. Previously, he was a Saul Stern uh, professor of civic engagement and the acting dean at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland, where he's also the director of the Institute for Philosophy and Public Policy. Again, in the past, he was founding director of the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, and the executive director of the National Commission on Civic Renewal, co-chaired by William Bennett and Sam Nunn. Um, his books include Liberal Pluralism, The Practice of Liberal Pluralism, Poverty and Poverty and Morality, uh, all of which both uh, Nick's most recent book and Bill's most recent book are, are, are available out there in the lobby. Finally, he earned his PhD from the University of Chicago. Our format will be that I will ask uh, uh, first Nick and then Bill to come up to the podium, speak for 10 to 20 minutes, uh, uh, and then uh, we will have a little conversation, ask some questions among ourselves, try to get a conversation going, then we'll open it up to the audience, because I'm, sure I'm sure you'll have questions. So again, thank you for being here, and let's, let's enjoy this. Dave, thank you for inviting us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. And uh, I have to say that it's a special honor for me to be able to share the stage with Bill Galston, who's not only a, uh, I think, a truly distinguished public servant in modern America, but also a really formidable intellect. Um, his essay in this book is terrific, if I uh, can say so. And I think it's uh, worth the price of the volume in and of itself. Um, let me try to make my own case, though. Um, America's democracy, the democracy our forefathers bequeathed us, is in danger today, and the threat is not from abroad. Instead, it comes from at home, I would say, from the explosive and unfettered growth of our entitlement program transfers. Uh, now, I realize that this is a dramatic assertion, and I mean to try to substantiate it, 
Uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to make the case that our ever-expanding government entitlements complex is fundamentally transforming both the nature of our governmental system and also our very way of life. Um, within living memory, the federal government has become an entitlement machine. At the national level, all other aspects of governments, uh, governance in terms of sheer outlays have taken a back seat to what has now become the prime task of state, which is namely transferring other people's money. At the individual level, America is now approaching a milestone. Almost half of our people live in homes that accept money, goods, or services from one or more government benefit program. In terms of overall resources, over $1 in six, nearly $1 in five, in our citizens' personal income ledgers is now accounted for by these government transfers. Dependence always creates moral hazard. Our increasing dependence on entitlements is no different. Our behavior, our values, and our expectations are being demonstrably altered by this rising tide of entitlements, and not in good ways. Grown men are finding it easier to opt out of the workforce, Gaming the entitlement system is becoming a national pastime, and not only for the poor. Plundering our children's inheritance to finance our own lifestyles is becoming the new normal, and protecting our increasingly lavish entitlement outlays now threatens to come at the expense of our actual national defense. Now, let me be clear about what I am not saying. I am not pointing a partisan finger here, quite the opposite. Unfortunately, with a few honorable individual exceptions, both political parties have been manifestly complicit in creating our current entitlement problem. Uh, nor am I suggesting that these arrangements are somehow unaffordable today or will be unaffordable next year or the year after that. We are a very rich country. For good or for ill, that wealth can allow us to pursue unwise or even positively destructive policies for a very long time if we so choose. My point, rather, is that our entitlement system has put us on a dangerous na national path, one subversive to the civic health and ultimately to our freedoms and political health. And with the magic of audiovisual uh, aids here, I'm going to try to show you in a few minutes uh, some of the homework that I've assembled, which I think makes the empirical case uh, much more vividly than I could in just a few minutes. Um, entitlement transfers are defined by at least one part of our government as being uh, transfers of goods and services to individuals for which no reciprocating service is given. Um, they include dozens and perhaps hundreds of different programs. Um, I'll get into what some of those programs are. Uh, but over the past 50 years, there has been an absolutely explosive and even revolutionary increase in outlays for this panoply of entitlements. Um, in current dollars, the outlays increased by a factor of almost 100 between 1960 and 2010 from about 24 billion to well over 2.2 trillion. Now, of course, the value of the dollar was pretty significantly debased over that period of time. We had an awful lot of inflation. But even after you take inflation into account, the total uh, inflation-adjusted value of these transfers increased by a factor of more than 12 in this 50-year period. Um, Let's make one more cut on this. Let's say we look at it in terms of uh, adjustments for inflation and adjustments for the size of our population. If you do that, then you still see that entitlement transfers increased by a factor of more than seven over this 50-year period. Um, they increased twice as fast as national income over this period. In 1960, all entitlement transfers accounted for about 6% of personal income in America. By 2010, they accounted for 18%. Their share tripled. By 2010, uh, 
the burden of entitlements in America on every man, woman, and child was about $7,200. So if you think of a notional household of four, that's about almost $29,000. And uh, those transfers were received, but somebody had to pay for them too. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, in, in 1960, uh, as in more or less all of previous U.S. history, with a couple of annual exceptions, um, entitlements counted for a relatively small share of all federal spending, one dollar out of three. The other two dollars went to things like defense and the post office and justice and paying national debt, the things that we talk about in our Constitution as being government. Uh, by 2010, the situation had been totally reversed. Um, by 2010, one dollar out of three that the federal government was spending went to all of those aspects of government. Two dollars out of three went to entitlement transfers. That's why I say that the federal government in our lifetime has become an entitlement machine, because that is what it mainly does. Um, this little graphic here tries to break down the various categories of entitlements that we allocate uh, resources to. The uh, little light blue line on the bottom is for needs-based, which is to say more or less income or poverty-related transfers of income and goods, things like food stamps, for example, or temporary aid for needy families, which used to be called AFDC. The little purple patch on top of it is needs-based uh, needs or poverty-related health care programs, mainly Medicaid. You'll see that the next two, the red and the blue uh, segments on top of it, the great big ones, are what we'd call middle-class transfers in the main. There's Social Security and Medicare, uh, which are given not on the basis of income or need, but rather of for the most part, to people who have worked, but then in, in later life. Um, and then there are a couple of little other things on top, but they're not, they're not substantial compared to those, uh, those dramatic ones. Um, over the past 30 years, we've seen a surge in the proportion of Americans who live in households that are accepting one or more government benefits. Uh, a jump from about 30% in, in the early 1980s to just about 50% now. Uh, and you can see, of course, that in, since the crash, I mean, in, in the recession, it's gone up. But it went up very much more dramatically in the years immediately before then. Our population is aging, so you'd expect, given our Social Security programs and our Medicare uh, Medicare programs, which are for older Americans, that there'd be some increase in the proportion of people receiving some entitlement benefits. But population aging, as best I can calculate, only accounts for about one-tenth of this big jump. Other things are going on, and I'm going to show you what one of those is. One of the things which is happening is uh, that we are seeing a tremendous increase in the share of American families that are applying for and accepting means-tested benefits. <coughs> that, um, that share jumped from about 16 or 17 percent in the late 1970s to over 30 percent by 2009, and the latest figures I've seen for 2011 show that 35 percent of Americans 107 million Americans are accepting one or more means-tested benefit, according to the Census Bureau. The, the thing that I find very dramatic in this chart is that there seems to be no correspondence between the ups and downs of the, uh, of the business cycle, of the unemployment curve, and the trajectory of the proportion of Americans on means-tested benefits. You'd see the same sort of disconnect if you looked at the change in poverty rate over time. The best predictor of the increase in the proportion of Americans on means-tested benefits nowadays is the calendar year. 
each extra calendar year, this almost relentlessly increases. And decade by decade, it is increasing at a pace of about four percentage points, which is to say we are on track, if this continues, to having a majority of Americans sometime in the future on means-tested benefits. Um, there are, I think, some very troubling consequences of this proliferation of entitlements and this transition to entitlements in society. Uh, the first is the flight of men from the workforce. Uh, in the 1990s, Bill Goldston, I think, was honorably very much at the center of this. There was an effort to reform our welfare system, and uh, I think we made some big important changes there. There was a focus at that time, and I think in previous decades in discussion and policy circles as well, on the problems of dependence for single parent families, especially uh, mother-headed families and their children. We haven't paid much attention to the impact of the entitlement state on men. But if you look at this chart, you will see that with the growth of entitlements, there has been a really dramatic flight from work by adult men. Um, and if I were to show you a graph comparing the labor force participation rates of men in their 30s in the United States to men in their 30s in Greece, you might be surprised to see that the labor force participation for Greek men is uh, noticeably higher than for American men. Uh, we're used to thinking about uh, people in Europe as having um, five-week vacations or whatever. The striking thing is that for a lot of American men, the vacation is 52 weeks, and it's a growing fraction. Um, related to this has been the increased, I think, um, temptation to game the system. And again, we've, we've all heard the trope of welfare Cadillac and all of that sort of stuff from the past. Um, that is, uh, I think that's really yesterday's news. The, um, the real industry here is looking at what's happened with the explosion of disability payments in the United States. At this point in time, According to the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, over 11 million working age, 12 million, over 12 million working age Americans are receiving one or more disability benefit. And to put that in perspective, the number of paid employees in the U.S. manufacturing sector last year was a little under 12 million. So our army of disability payees is now larger than our manufacturing workforce. Um, what is particularly striking about this explosion of disability, at least to me as a demographer, is that uh, today America has a, its healthiest uh, working age population in history. Uh, the health of our working age population has been progressively improving, and it's, a, I think, a really troubling paradox to see that we now also have the highest ratio of disability payees to working people that we've ever had in, in American life. Um, there is a third aspect of the explosion of entitlements that I find troubling, and that has to do with borrowing uh, and, and accumulating debt to pay for current entitlement consumption. Remember I said earlier that entitlement spending has to be paid for by someone. Uh, some of those someones are people who are being taxed today, and others of those someones are people who are, are the unborn, who are being taxed through future debt. Of course, the nice thing about accumulating debt and in effect taxing the unborn is that the unborn don't have a vote nowadays. Um, we hear a lot in politics about the people who want to protect the rights of the unborn or other sides of the argument. One thing I can tell you uh, is that the Social Security program and the Medicare program have no protections for the rights of the unborn, and those programs are tens of trillions of dollars underfunded. Those promises have to be made up somehow, and they're not going to be made up out of their current resources on their current trajectories. Um, one last point that I'll make here has to do with our defense, uh, our defense burden and our entitlement burden. Um, 
I assume that there is a fair amount of waste, fraud, and abuse in our defense programs. I don't see why they should be any different from our other government programs. Uh, but we are now hearing that defense is becoming increasingly unaffordable for the United States. That's a very different sort of argument from saying that it's full of waste or that we wish to have other priorities. Um, entitlement spending has exceeded uh, defense spending for about 40 years. And nowadays, for every dollar of defense spending that we commit, we're committing about $3 to entitlement spending. Now, how does this exactly make defense spending unaffordable? That's not clear to me exactly. Um, we are the richest society in history, and our ratio of defense spending to military spending, uh, excuse me, defense spending to economic output is not at a historic low, but it's much lower than it was, say, when Eisenhower warned of the growing military-industrial complex. Um, I think we've, we head towards an argument that says that defense spending is unaffordable if we wish to hold entitlement sacrosanct. And it's not, I don't think it's just my fear that this is what might happen someday. Uh, the way that I look at the sequestration debate that's gone on in the United States uh, over the past uh, year plus, it looks to me as if this is precisely what we've uh, ended up doing. Um, so to conclude, I think that we've got, uh, we can see that the explosion of entitlements in the United States uh, has already begun to transform our governmental system. It is already having uh, very substantial impacts on uh, society and economy. Uh, as I mentioned, I believe, earlier, I don't think that this is unsustainable. Actually, if I thought that it was unsustainable, I might be slightly more relieved about it, since economic reality might bring this to, uh, to a conclusion. But, I think that unless we have a national awareness of the problem and a serious discussion of it, uh, we'll find that some of these troubling trends I induced here will continue and uh, permeate the United States even more uh, significantly in the years immediately ahead. Thank you very much. Well, I'm fine. First of all, let me, let me repeat uh, Nick's thanks uh, to, first of all, to Professor Mack uh, for the initial invitation, and then to President Van Zant uh, for agreeing to moderate this and to be a host for much of the evening. Uh, Having spent a little bit of time as a university administrator myself, I know how precious your evenings are. And I am very grateful that you've been willing to share one of your scarce free evenings with us. Whether your wife shares that point of view remains to be seen. I'll, I'll meet her. Exactly. Uh, and I, I also want to think, you know, I also want to thank, uh, Nick, uh, thank, right, thank Nick Eberstadt for his very generous remarks, or should I say apparently generous remarks. Uh, why do I say that? Well, he held up this volume and said that my essay alone was worth the price of the volume. What he neglected to say was that the volume is available for free. <laughs> uh, now, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, now, this is billed as a debate, and I suppose you can call it a debate, but this is not the kind of debate that we witnessed on national television a few days ago. You know, why not? Well, for, we're obviously not running for anything, and secondly, 
The aim in this debate is not victory. Uh, we are both academics and scholars by training and by profession. We come at this issue from different points of view, but I think we share the same end, and that is to get as close to the truth of the matter as we can. And the point of encounters like this is the underlying suspicion that the truth of the matter may draw on elements from both of our analyses. But you are probably better judges of that than, than we are because, in fact, we have a certain amount of, shall we say, sunk costs in our respective positions that always makes it a little harder to be agile than people who don't have uh, those costs already incurred. Okay. What are the central arguments that I'm going to be making in my opening remarks? There are three of them, and they're pretty straightforward. Point number one is a, is a conceptual point, which is also a social scientific point. And that is the politically driven dyad of dependence and independence is much too simple to capture either the underlying social reality or the, the, what is at stake morally in this discussion. Because there's a third leg of that stool, interdependence. And one of the things that I want to argue is that interdependence, at least over a life cycle, is a pervasive phenomenon in society. And if we just take a snapshot we may end up seeing dependence when the, the overall picture is much more complex than that. And what I, uh, I want to argue that you see interdependence not only at the family level, but also at the society level and in the construction of many, though not all, of our social programs. And I regard interdependence as morally unproblematic, indeed, it is one of the defining conditions of our species, and if it is organized correctly, it is an ennobling feature of human life. So that's my first argument, not just dependence and independence, but interdependence. Here is my second argument. Dependence, or at least the kind of dependence that we're worried about tonight, is a moral condition. And it is not something that can simply been, be inferred from the receipt of benefits. Uh, the kind of dependence that I think Nick Eberstadt and I are worried about this evening is what might be called surplus dependence. That is to say, the failure to do one's part, to contribute one's share, when it is possible for you to do so. There are some people who are dependent on others through no fault of their own. That is a permanent condition. Uh, and they could be the, the best of all of their possible selves, and there would be no way of evading that fact. And you know, I refer, of course, to people who are born with certain sorts of disabilities that, you know, that define their lives, though not, though not entirely, but in many other ways as well. Here's the third point I'm going to make. Uh, there is indeed an entitlement state that has grown up since the Second World War, indeed over the past 50 years. And there are some very real problems that the entitlement state is now encountering. But the main problem is not that it encourages dependence, but rather that it flunks the test of arithmetic. Uh, Unlike Nick Eberstadt, I actually believe that it cannot be sustained at its current level. It may be arithmetically possible to sustain it at its current level, but it is neither politically nor economically possible. And so I don't know whether this makes me an optimist or a pessimist, but I do think that something is going to have to give way. Uh, and the, you know, the longer it takes to change, uh, the more the persistence of an unsustainable status quo is going to encourage obfuscation, myopia, generational selfishness, 
and the poor allocation of inherently scarce resources. So reform of our current programs is essential, but in my judgment and in my argument, dependence, this moral condition, is not the principal reason why. So those are my three arguments in brief. Now, in more detail, uh, I think it is very, very important for political and policy dialogue in the United States today that those who are discussing it operate off the same set of facts. That is a condition that obviously, notoriously, does not obtain in our current political dialogue. And uh, if you look at some of the, if, if you look at some of the factual disagreements that impeded anything like a meaningful discussion in the second presidential debate, that impede anything like a meaningful discussion of our fiscal circumstances because different parties and different analytical groups use different baselines, different metrics, you can go on and on the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, may he rest in peace, although I doubt it, uh, you, know, once, you, know, you, know, you once said that while every man is entitled to his own opinions, he's not entitled to his own facts. He is hopelessly out of date by the standards of contemporary American politics. We all appear to believe that we're entitled to our own facts, and that makes productive discussion almost impossible. That's not what's going to happen tonight, because it is neither my, it, it, it's not my intention to challenge the very nice charts that Nick Eberstadt presented for your inspection and another 25 that he could, but in a spirit of forbearance did not. Uh, and my only, you know, I, I'm going to make only two points about the facts. First of all, while they're the truth, they're not the whole truth. There are other aspects that are worth considering. First of all, while all of the lines that he presented go up, there are other lines that don't go up. For example, entitlement transfers, according to the Congressional Budget Office, as a share of household income have not changed in the past 30 years. They varied between 11 and 12 percent through that entire period, and that's roughly where they are today. Second, and this is a, this, this is a question of nuance, but it's, it's, it's more than trivial. According to that same CBO study, if entitlement payments are encouraging and increasing dependence, it's not among the poor, it's among the middle class and even the upper middle class. Why do I save that? Well, as you know, you know economic analysts divide the, you know, the household income in the United States into five quintiles, highest 20%, the next, the next, the next, and then finally, the lowest 20%. Well, in the past 30 years, the share of these entitlement transfers going to the people at the bottom has been cut by one third from 54% to only 36%. So the lion's share of these programmatic benefits now go to people who are not poor and who are not near poor. Now, we can have in our long argument about whether that's a problem or not, I'm going to argue, is that, argue that in most respects it's not. But this idea that the poor are getting more and more and the rest of us are transferring to the poor to pay is really, uh, I think, uh, not, not correct. And I'm not saying that Nick Eberstadt said that, but one might unwarily draw that kind of conclusion from the data uh, presented thus far. So. So not the whole truth, that's point number one. And number two, it leaves out the question of why this growth has occurred. Is it simply a diminution of the moral fiber of the American people? I think not. There are three large trends, demographic trends, that have driven much, though not all, of the increase that, uh, that, that Nick Eberstadt has presented in his charge. Number one, we are an aging society. And because we have decided over the course of generations, and we can argue about whether this is a good decision or a bad decision, to socialize the costs of old age to a much greater extent than we socialize the costs of infancy and, and youth, an aging society in principle means an increasing amount of transfer, of transfer payments to 
the elderly. And uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, the share going to the poor and near poor has declined because many of the elderly to whom these transfers are made are not poor or near poor and would not be poor or near poor, poor even if they did not receive those payments. Second, there has been in the past generation a near disappearance of defined benefit pensions in the private sector. And that has created a void uh, into which the federal government has chosen to step. And I think that within limits, that's not entirely a bad thing. Third, as has been well advertised and what is now a matter of consensus across partisan and ideological grounds, which it was not 10 years ago or even five years ago, in the past 30 years, we have become a substantially more unequal society as measured by income. Indeed, in 2007, right before the Great Recession, the share of the national income commanded by the top 1%, 5%, 10%, rose to levels not seen since 1928. Uh, the year before the great, the great Depression. And the rise of inequality as well has intensified some pressures on the public sector. So here's my next, you know, here's my next point. Uh, when we talk about, when we talk about dependence, we have to be very careful what we're talking about. Uh, Entitlement and dependence are not the same thing. And to illustrate my point, let me quote from, I think, the very precise definition that Nick Epperstadt uh, provides of the concept of entitlement. Uh, here's what he says, and I quote, government entitlement payments are benefits to which a person holds an established right under law i.e. to which a person is entitled. No argument between us about that. A defining feature of these payments is that they are, and I quote, benefits received for which no current service is performed. That adjective makes a difference because a huge percentage of the entitlement programs that have driven the upward, the, the rising lines in Nick Ebert's charts are in fact contributory programs. You know what I'm talking about, in particular, Social Security and Medicare. Now, it is certainly the case that in the aggregate, people are not contributing the actuarial equivalent of what they are entitled to draw from these programs, so there is an imbalance between contributions on the one hand and, and, and benefits on the other, and I have argued that that is a problem that our political system has to address, and then we can argue about how to address it, but address, address it we must. But I don't think that anybody would seriously argue, and I don't think Nick Eberstadt would seriously argue, that a contributory program of social insurance can easily be equated with dependence. That's really not what we're talking about. Second, Progressivity and dependence are not the same thing. Let me illustrate with the Social Security program. As everybody knows, the Social Security benefits are structured progressively even though it is paid for through a flat tax, which is by definition not a progressive tax. And what I mean by that is that the people, the highest income earners, get back in actuarial terms less than what they contribute. The people in the middle get back about what they contribute, and the people at the bottom get back more than they contribute. There is, within the Social Security system, a shift of resources from the top to the bottom. Query, is that a problem? Is that what we're talking about when we worry about dependence? Again, I don't think so. So progressivity is one thing, dependence is another. Third point, even if we're not talking about contributory, contributory programs, programs that support work and other desirable activities, responsible activities in our society, are not the same thing as dependence either. 
And let me give you two examples. Uh, as some of you may know, there's a program that was created in the mid-1970s and which enjoys broad bipartisan public support called the Earned Income Tax Credit. What that credit says, what that program says very simply, if you're a low-wage worker working a substantial portion of each week and your income is below a certain threshold, the federal government will provide a credit that increases your income, a tax credit. And it's a refundable tax credit, which means, technically speaking, that even if the credit exceeds your income taxes, which it frequently, indeed, usually does, uh, you still receive it in the form of, in effect, a wage and earnings supplement. Federal programs, entitlement to which depend on work, and which are intended and do have the effect of encouraging work as well as family responsibility, are not the same as dependents. And Nick, second point, you know, second example, Nick was kind enough to mention the 1996 Clinton welfare reform bill. And I suspect there are mixed views on that, on that bill in this room. Nonetheless, it is a fact that spending under the welfare reform bill of 1996 for beneficiaries exceeded the spending under the old system. But the point was its intention was different. Its objective was different. Its objective was to help single parents, usually mothers, move from permanent dependence on monthly welfare checks to the world of work which involved transportation supports, it, include, it included medical su assistance, and yes, it also brought into play the earned income tax credit. Once again, the Clinton welfare reform bill did not promote dependence, it did just the work. It promoted independence, even though the cash value of what the beneficiaries got under the Clinton system was actually greater than the cash value under the old AFDC system. I move toward my conclusion uh, with, you know, with some observations that will bring our two arguments into somewhat closer conjunction. None of which I just said it should be interpreted to say or to mean that there aren't real, program, real problems with some current programs. There most certainly are. Uh, and I agree with Nick Eberstadt that the Social Security disability insurance system is being badly abused right now with the, with the collusion of sympathetic administrative law judges who are not doing their duty to faithfully administer the terms of the program. And if you, if you read my essay in this volume, you will see some very specific evidence and examples of that. Number two, I think that the food stamp program has been expanded in ways that are unwise and unnecessary. Uh, and I don't think it's a good thing right now that 47, 47 million Americans are receiving food stamps. And we need to think very hard, uh, very hard about how to reform the program so that genuine food needs are being met and the program is not being used as one more income supplement. Third, and this is the one that really worries me the most, uh, declining male labor force participation in the United States. The statistics are undeniable. Since the end of the Second World, World War, female participation in the labor force has doubled from 30% to 60%. And during that same period, male labor force participation has fallen by 15 percentage points from 90% to about 75%. This is a real problem. The question is why it's happened. Uh, the listener might get the impression from Nick Eberstadt's presentation that entitlement programs are principally to blame. Analytically, I don't think that's true. There are all sorts of reasons analytically why I don't think that's true, or at least it's not the whole truth or even most of the truth. But I've studied this issue as have a number of very, very good labor market economists, which I'm not, and there are lots of other explanations, uh, such as the collapse of manufacturing as a source of mass employment for less educated men, uh, 
the failure of men to avail themselves of opportunities for post-secondary education and training to the extent, same extent that women have in the past generation. Uh, the speculation uh, for which there's some evidence that the shift from an industrial to a post-industrial society has, relatively speaking, played to the strengths of women as opposed to the strengths of men. Uh, the fact that as women have moved into the labor force, uh, they are no longer content to accept as mates uh, men who are who can provide only modestly or not at all for the support of them and their families because women have more financial independence than they used to. And finally, and this would be a very long story, the changing structure of the American family has not worked to the benefit of boys and young men. So in conclusion uh, and in summary, you know, left unreformed, the programs that we've been talking about so far, the programs created in the past half century, will make it increasingly difficult to stabilize our finances, to invest in the future, to defend our country, and to carry out the positive role that we play in the world. These, I think, are compelling reasons to rethink the entitlement state. But these reasons don't have much to do with an alleged culture of dependence, the evidence for which, in my judgment, is thin. As long as we each do our part, as we are able, uh, there is no harm in benefiting from programs we help sustain. As long as we contribute our share, receiving benefits is morally unproblematic, even, even if the share that we can contribute is smaller than the share that we received. We can be a nation of takers as long as we're a nation of givers as well. As long as we honor the norm of reciprocity and practice interdependence, not only for our compatriots but for our posterity, I think that the American society can steer a steady, a sustainable, and an honorable course. But I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, to both of you for those very cogent, um, cogent uh, talks. Um, I'd like to start out uh, by noting that, uh, as you both of you sort of said many times, you actually don't disagree on much. So um, I'm not going to be put in the position of Candy Crowley and trying to separate you as you posture as two roosters walking around each other. But um, um, I thought maybe I, I try to identify some points of difference to try to get you to respond to it. But first, let me ask just, and this is really more for Nick, a, a question that struck me in reading both your book and then the responses uh, by Bill and um, um, I've forgotten who the other responder. Yeah, Levin. All right. Um, you have a, just a whole, I don't know if people have seen this book, you open it up and there's just page after page of horrible looking graphs and, and text the about, graphs well the graphs are pretty, but <laughs> yes, yes, what, what the graphs actually suggest is, is, is horrible. And you know, through all that though, uh, there was no mention of other countries. And I think the conception in the US is that, uh, at least maybe from the Republican side, is that you know, the Europeans are even worse off when it comes to this. Is, is, is there anything, you know, how do we compare it to other countries in this regard? That's, I mean, that's a terribly important question, and I didn't, uh, I didn't address that directly except in the section on labor force participation, where I uh, tried to show that labor force participation for men in peak working ages was lower in the United States than almost anywhere in Europe. Uh, the reason that I didn't do too much uh, in the way of comparisons with Europe is because in, uh, in almost every part of Europe, there are, uh, there are health guarantees and national health systems uh, in which everybody would be uh, you know, part of what, by this definition, would be an entitlement uh, system. And so it would be is more complicated to make the comparison between the proportions over time, things like that. Um, more than that, 
I guess I also avoided this because I think that I think that Americans are kind of a strange bunch of pups. I think they're kind of different from Europeans in some fundamental historical sorts of ways. And, I mean, it gets back to uh, you know to Tocqueville and to the whole American exceptionalism thing, and to our own. Uh, uh, for good or for ill, uh, focus on self-reliance. Um, it's it's meant that our it's meant that our welfare state has evolved in very different ways from I think the continental welfare states in particular. I mean, you can also say the the, the British welfare state and the the beverage report and all of that uh, is closer to the continental model than to the U.S. model, but the to the extent that there are national myths involved. The national myth in Europe was that uh, people are kind of trapped in their station of birth, and the national myth in the United States is you can come uh, with a suitcase and five dollars and become a billionaire. And we have this Puritan thing about the deserving and the undeserving poor, which is absent from a lot of the continental systems. So I, I didn't get into that too much for all of those kind of reasons. Well, I, can see, I, I, can, I understand why you couldn't get into it, but, but is, I mean, I guess I'm sitting here thinking, it must be the Europeans, though, are worse off. If they have a health care system, which is, for example, that it covers more people, is more thorough in its coverage, they're even in a worse position than we are, uh, maybe not in terms of dependence, we'll come back to that, but just in terms of, of intergenerational spending. There, there, I mean, as you know, the fiscal uh, situation in a lot of uh, European countries is pretty grim right now, and uh, I mean, makes uh, makes ours look, for the moment, you know, kind of uh, uh, better. Uh, not in all European states, but I guess mainly in the Mediterranean ones. But I think, in fairness, you'd say that uh, most, uh, not most, but many Europeans who uh, you know read this book would think that I was from Mars because it's, it's just an absolutely un-European conception, uh, this, yeah. this whole entitlement thing. It's a, completely, it's a completely foreign language and there's no Google Translate function that'll get you from Tocqueville into you know, right. Eurospeak. Right. Let me, let me um, uh, I mean, do you have anything, any comment on that or I can move on to, on the European situation? Or? Well, only from an analytical standpoint, it would be interesting to strip out health care and then see you know, how right. Europe and the United States compare with what's left. And uh, that, that's doable, and I'm not sure I know how that would come out, but uh, it, it would be, I think, quite revealing to do that. Well, and that actually leads into my next question, which has to do with Medicare. You know, Neither of you really talk much about Medi Medicare just now. Um, you know, it was lumped in with other kinds of, of, of transfer payments. Uh, but it seems, at least from what I read, it seems to be the biggest part of, and, and certainly the fastest growing part of all this. Um, and, and, and the other uh, contributor to your book, Levin, he, he actually, I think, focused on the fact that uh, what's really going on is Medicare or health care costs are, are rising so rapidly, Medicare is covering them. Uh, that I, I think at one point he, he says that it may even be that we're getting no more, individuals are getting no more in terms of real health or real medical care. It's just it's gotten more and more expensive um, for any variety of reasons. And that's really the, the driver in, in all of this. It certainly is driver in the budget, budget issues. Oh, maybe you both can comment on that, the role of Medicare. Um, yeah. Um, I would, the, so as, as, Bill, as Bill said, the social security problem is a lot more susceptible to a technical fix than the Medicare problem just because of the orders of difference in the magnitude of the unfunded liability there. You can imagine a way, in, or at least I can imagine a way, in which the social security deficit could be eliminated through a number of things that probably wouldn't cause people to riot in the United States. Um, the, as you say, the deficit in the, uh, the unfunded liabilities in the Medicare system is in the tens of trillions of dollars. Uh, and it, it just built in there like that. Uh, since, since neither of those systems, by the way, are now, or I think, practically ever have been solvent actuarially. That's why I see these as part of the entitlement discussion. If, 
if they were run kind of like you know Geico or like uh, State Farm Auto Insurance or something, um, you know, you'd, you'd have the reciprocity, you'd have the pooled risk, you'd have the things which are all desirable about social insurance programs and be social insurance programs, and we could you know argue about whether the benefit levels are too high or the tax uh, you know contributions are too high or whatever. Um, the uh, one of the problems, I think, and this is, this is not perhaps the main problem, but it's certainly a, a very present one in Medicare, is the problem of spending other people's money. And as you will notice in this book, uh, I see that as a moral hazard in almost all of our entitlement programs. And economists talk about this problem in other sorts of ways. They talk about it in terms of public choice theory, or they talk about an agent principle problems. But uh, part of the problem is the spending other people's money problem there. Um, in the, uh, I mean, to be, to be brutal about it, either one has to, to make the Medicare program work, you're either going to have to uh, increase uh, contributions and payments by a whole lot or limit outlays by a whole lot if these things are going to come into balance or else somehow miraculously make the United States grow faster than China for the next uh, you know, 50 years. But there aren't any other arithmetic ways to get at this. Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, you know, as they say in Washington, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Except when I say that, I mean it. <laughs> the, uh, you know, let me make, let me make three points. The first one is the first one is an analytical point, and the second one is a moral point, and the third one is a policy point. Uh, CBO a couple of years ago did a very interesting study of exactly your question, and they asked they asked the following question: Over the next two generations, what are the relative contributions? of demographic changes, the aging of the society, and cost changes that mainly driven by technology, you know, between now and, you know, the, you know, now and, you know, say 2050, something like that, the next two generations. It turns out that in the phase that we're in now, it is the demography, the aging of the population, you know, this inexorable flow of people born the year I was born, 1946, and later, into the Medicare program that is the predominant driver. As this mouse in the snake gradually flows through it by sometime in the early 2030s, then technology becomes the dominant force and the cost increases that te technological improvements in healthcare generates. So I wish it were as simple as containing costs, restraining technology. Not that that's simple, but However difficult that may be, it's even harder to take people who are flowing into an existing program by the thousands every week. I, I mean, you know, how do you how do you turn off that spigot? You can't. So that's the first point. You know, getting the analysis right because you can't get the solution right if you don't have the analysis right. The second is a moral point, which is actually one of the most profound moral issues facing our society. A political philosopher uh, who's been known to show up at the New School from time to time, and some of you may have heard of, a uh, very, very fine man by the name of Michael Walzer, you know, taught at Harvard and was at the Institute of Advanced Studies for many years, a distinguished political philosopher, made a comment in a book that he published almost 30 years ago that has stuck with me ever since. He said, in the medieval and early modern period, business, the government was in the business of caring, people, caring for people's souls, but not for their bodies. And today, it's the, exactly the other way around. Uh, and so I could, you know, if I had a course to teach on this great transformation, I think I could show you by working through philosophers and writers over a period of about four centuries, why it is that the preservation of health and life have moved to center stage in our political system. Suffice it to say that it has. And so when we're talking about health care, we're not just talking about 
a policy issue. You know, we are talking about an objective of our social life that has moved from the periphery to the absolute center in the development of modern society. And that creates, I think, some especially intractable difficulties in dealing with it. Now third, the policy point. Uh, you have all heard the phrase social insurance. And what that phrase evokes, of course, is the idea of an insurance system that is administered by the public sector rather than the private sector. And I think it's useful to think about that analogy a little bit more carefully than ordinarily happens. Let me give you, let me give you an example. When we buy home insurance, we insure ourselves against risks that are either expensive or outright catastrophic. Uh, you know, fires, fires, floods, uh, you know, tree falling, trees falling on your house, which actually just happened to some good friends of mine, you know, destroying half their houses as a result of one of these, I believe, global climate change induced, you know, wind, wind storms that have now buffeting Washington, D.C. on a very regular basis. Okay, that's what insurance is for. I don't know of a single home insurance policy that sells insurance that covers a coat of paint on your house. That's not what insurance is for. And I think we need to ask ourselves, what is health insurance for? I guarantee you that if health insurance is supposed to provide first dollar coverage of our health care needs, it will be in principle unaffordable. And it already is. So I think, now I'm not saying that we should retreat all the way to a catastrophic system, but if we take the insurance part of the phrase social insurance seriously, then we should ask ourselves what insurance is for. I'm all in favor of paying for essential medical services that people, particularly people who are poor and near poor, cannot otherwise pay for. That's not the issue. The question is, what about the rest of us? How should we think about that? So you're ready to get rid of a large part of Medicare? Not a large part, necessarily, but I do not believe that the model of first dollar coverage for medical expenses makes any sense. And nor do I believe that modest co-pays for, you know, for services that most people can finance out of their own pockets is the way to go either. And this is a moderate position. As you know, if you've been listening to the debate in this presidential election, there are many people who are in favor of a radical structural change in Medicare. I can guarantee you the status quo is not an op option. So we either consider modest changes like the one I'm, you know, I'm advancing, or on, we're on the road to Paul Ryan's budget. Well, <clears throat> uh, by the way, you, you couldn't run for president saying anything like that today. I mean, you know, it, it's tough. It's tough. Uh, let me, let me. One point of difference that I noticed was the future, and it struck me as a little bit uh, counterintuitive that you have different views of what the future holds. I think, Nick, you were saying that we can continue, however you describe this entitlement system, on for, for almost forever. Um, it, whereas, Bill, I think you said it's going to come to a crisis point if we don't change something and the system will collapse. Um, do I have that right? And, and is, that really, you know, is that really the case? And what underlies your question is the sense that Nick ought to be taking my position and I ought to be taking Nick's position, Well, right? you know, I think that would be pretty standard, yeah, yeah. 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 Sir, yeah. Um, I, I think that if we continue on this path, it is uh, predictably going to end in tears. Um, paradoxically, because I suspect we could actually continue on this path much longer than maybe Bill suspects, there'd be a whole lot more tears at the end. Um, the reason I fear we can, well, there are several reasons I fear that we can continue uh, 
business as usual. The first is the collusive nature between the two political parties in supporting the entitlement state. I, uh, in, in this study, one of the things that I found, which I was kind of surprised by, is that uh, spending on national entitlement programs tends to be higher under Republican presidents than under Democratic presidents. All other things being equal, it tends to be about eight or nine percent higher in any given calendar year. Um, I think this reinforces the kind of the a problem of the, uh, the public choice consensus we have in both parties uh, for the most part in supporting this. So we've got a, we've got a political consensus in Washington at least for maybe talking brave about this but continuing the, uh, continuing the game. Um, because we are such, a, such an affluent society, we've got an awful lot of options in continuing this game before economic uh, exigence intrudes and brings things to an end. Um, at the mo I mean, just put it this way, um, we, have a, uh, we have a burden of public debt in relation to uh, GDP of about, what, 109, 108, 109%, we're up around there. Um, but we have an enormous amount of uh, personal credit, we've got an enormous amount of corporate credit. I mean, if you look at all of those different sources of credit in the United States, there's about uh, a, ra a ratio of over 400% of debt to GDP. Uh, there's a lot that can be still crowded out. We can crowd out our ability to get mortgages, we can crowd out our ability to finance businesses. Uh, it won't be very pretty, but we can do it. And then, of course, we've got the option of degrading the dollar even further and trying to tax foreigners to support our welfare state in, uh, indirectly by, uh, by gaming off our status as a reserve currency until we're no longer a reserve currency. Um, I mean, all of those things could happen uh, to keep the game going, um, but it would not be a very pretty ending. Well, let me, let me explain my position because it's actually not very complicated. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, and stylistically, you know, schematically, right now the federal government, you know, s consumes, uh, well, before the, back up, before the Great Recession changed the, uh, the denominator so much, you know, the, the federal government consumed about 20% of the gross domestic product. And because production and production fell and the national income fell so substantially during the Great Recession and other compensatory programs kicked in, that rose to about 25%. But as the economy improves and as many of these temporary programs end, that 25% will subside back to 20 or 21%. If we continue on our current course in the programs that we've been talking about, that 20% will nearly double yep. to about 40% within one generation. Yep. One generation. Now, I would like, you know, this is a thought experiment. What are the chance, A, what are the chances that the political system would entertain the level of taxation that would be needed to sustain a doubling of the share of the federal government's the federal government as a percentage of the gross domestic product? Nil. Thank you. <laughs> Secondly, before we even before we even get to the politics of the situation, I'm not an economist and I try never to play one on TV, but I want, you to, I want you to consider what would happen if we do try to keep the tax system going in tandem with the rise in entitlement payments. You don't have to be a supply sider to believe that sooner or later, and I would say sooner rather than later, that's going to have very significant effects on aggregate growth rates. And I say this especially you know, Nick has referred quite properly to differences between the United States and Europe. Here's another one. 
We make a big mistake in the United States if we just look at spending at the federal level because unlike much more centralized European states, right. we do an enormous amount of spending at the state That's and right. the local level as well, which is not financed through transfers from the center. So well before we get to the federal government as 40% of gross domestic product, we will have reached a point where government is vastly more expensive in the United States than it is in any European country. Does anybody think that's going to happen? So no, I stand by my proposition that this is unsustainable. And listening to what Nick had to say, I think the only argument begin, between us is when an unsustainable situation will no longer be sustained. Well, well what, what is going to cause, what is, what is going to be the trigger event? The Chinese well, stop I'll, buying bonds. I'll give you one. Uh, first, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you one or several. Number one, right now, we're borrowing money for free. Right. You know? and, you know, and so we're right now, we're living in a fool's paradise because we are borrowing very large sums, much of it from abroad, but we're hardly paying any interest on our debt. But here's an interesting fact about all of this. We're selling mainly short-term debt, which means that when interest rates rise back towards normal levels, which they will when our, when our economy gets healthy again, you know, interest rates on the federal debt will very quickly increase by a factor of three, four, or even five, based on your assumptions. And then you're talking about real money. That's number one. Number two, and this was the thrust of, of, of your elucidation of your question, it presupposes that the rest of the world will continue to send us so much money. Want to know why they're sending us so much money right now? We are seen as a safe haven in a heartless and dangerous world. But, you know, but that's not written in, you know, on tablets of stone in letters of jade. That can change, and it will change. And when we're no longer seen as a safe haven, then, you know, Larry Summers, you know, the, the, you know the, the Clinton and Obama era economist, you know, said something very interesting. I disagree with Larry about lots of things, but here's one thing he said that is very true and very wise. He said that economic, you know, sh economic changes always take much longer than you expect they will, and then when they occur, they happen much more rapidly than you imagine they can. And so my fear is, sort of, you know those cartoons where, you know, where Wiley e. Coyote, you know, runs to the edge of the cliff and then keeps on walking for a while, then he looks down and realizes that he's off the edge of the cliff and he plunges. Well, that's the way economic change happens. In today's global markets, once opinions change about the future, there are abrupt step functional changes in underlying economic realities. This scares me to death. And I don't think we're going to go on for another 20 years or even another 10 years. Uh, and, and that doesn't scare you, Nick? Um, that I'm, cliff? That cliff? The, uh, the denouement that I'm talking about, I think, is even spookier than the one that <laughs> Bill's talking about. Can you top <laughs> this? Halloween, Halloween is coming, by the way. Well, Halloween. We're, we're scared and scareder, I think. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, beats Dumb and Dumber, I guess. Yeah. Uh, actually, that, that last point, uh, this is a very small uh, analytic point, but you and your analysis don't take into to account um, the, the interest the government pays. And I think you had another chart that showed that uh, almost all of the deficit that we've been running is attributable to those entitlement payments. So you could actually make it look a lot worse than it actually is if you took interest right. into account. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. I mean, this this um, this study that I've done is um, is not really an economic analysis. It's really a statistical analysis with you know, kind of uh, moral flavors, I guess, to it. I guess it's more like moral arithmetic or something from the uh, you know from the classical days. Um, I'm I'm much more concerned about what the uh, rise of the entitlement state is doing to the fabric of our society and to the way we behave towards one another than, uh, than I'm concerned about the fiscal cliff. I mean, the fiscal cliff seems to me like small potatoes compared to the, uh, the civic health of our society. And that's, I think, really the nub of our difference, or at least the nub of the difference of emphasis, 
And that is that as I look at the evidence, uh, I am not as concerned as Nick is about the moral changes induced by these fiscal and policy changes. Uh, I am not, com I'm not compelled by that evidence, and uh, which is not to say that I don't see serious problems in our social fabric, because I do, right? The question is, and I raised this in a very sketchy, not in President Obama's sense of the term sketchy, uh, but uh, schematic. schematic, thank you. That's a much better term. Very, very schematic way in, in my remarks. I am concerned, for example, about the increasing tendency of men who are capable of working to recuse themselves from the paid labor force. I think that's a serious problem. And I think, it's a, I think it's a problem with not only economic implications, because it, all other things being equal, it diminishes the overall capac productive capacity of our country quite seriously, as well as increasing social costs. I'm also worried about its impact on marriage, on children, and on neighborhoods and communities. And I think it would be easy to document the negative consequences along all of those generations. The issue that divides us is not whether this is a good thing or a bad thing from a social and moral point of view. It's analytical. Why is this happening? And Nick is arguing that it's happening in large measure because of the growth of these specific kinds of public programs. And I disagree with that. Uh, you, if you, I disagree with it in the first place, because if you look at this trend of male withdrawal from the paid labor force, it began shortly after the Second World War start that. during a period in which the programs that most of the programs that we're arguing about didn't exist and the ones that did like Social Security were trivial. That's number one. But number two, I think there are a number of other profound social changes in the United States that have occurred in, say, the past 40 years since I, you know, you know, since I, you know, left left college and and entered you know entered my adult life, uh, that are more plausible candidates for the ex you know the explanatory variables for this recusal of men from the labor. If we have a little bit more time for this colloquy before we shift to questions, this it seems to me yeah, is a I, yeah. very good case study. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what is your response to that, Nick? He does have some good. No, I mean I think that you can you can look at the exit of men from the labor force and account for as much as, as much as half with the explosion of disability over the, in terms of the percentage point changes. If you look at all of the different disability programs that uh, men are on, you can account for another couple of percentage points by population aging. But then there's stuff that you can't, that I can't account for in this schema, and I think that, I think that some of it, and I didn't get into any of this because this gets into very deep water here, and uh, this is a very short uh, study, has to do with the whole change in uh, family structure in the United States. I mean, one thing which, uh, one thing which has compelled men to work in the United States, at least in the past, was uh, getting married and having a wife and kids to support. And uh, that dynamic has changed really dramatically over the past uh, 50 years in particular. Um, I haven't parsed out how much family structure change is related to the exit of men from the workforce. But I guess if, as you know, a son of takers or something, maybe that's what I should. Uh, one of the things I should look at. Well, if I could just, uh, this is this may be too crass a summary, but your position, Nick, I think it's been that the the availability of entitlements has led to these various social ills, um, men dropping out of the workforce. Whereas I think, Bill, you're saying the entitlements are consequence of other social forces that drove men out of the workforce. Well, look, I, I, as a matter of emphasis and as a matter of proportion, I agree with that summary. This is, this is not a black and white difference, yeah. but let me, let me take a program. Yeah. Let me take a program where Nick and I agree some serious abuses are occurring. The social 
Security Disability Insurance Program. Now, one of the things that's happened in the past five years that has fueled the growth of this program is that a lot of men in their mid-50s sure. have, you know, ha have lost reasonably well-paying jobs and cannot find adequate substitutes for them. They, they find themselves forced into a kind of premature retirement well before our official retirement programs right. kick in. Right. They have turned to the Social Security Disability Program uh, as a way of filling in that five or seven year gap. I don't think it's the right thing to do to use SSDI for that purpose, but there are some, and nor do I think it's correct for administrative ju the judges administering the programs to lie and cheat, which they've been doing on a very, very substantial basis in order to facilitate the entry of men in this category into these programs. Uh, but it is, you know, but it's not the case that the programs themselves were causally responsible for the exodus of men from the paid labor force. It, you know, it makes it possible, and here I will, you know, here I'll concede the following, uh, the, the following point. If you've lost a $20 an hour job in, let us say, a textile plant in Alabama. There was a very interesting New York Times Magazine section piece on exactly this question about a month and a half ago by Hannah Rosen, uh, which I commend to all of your attention. If you, you know, if men have lost the $20 an hour job, they're 55 and the available substitute is a minimum wage job for 30 hours a week at McDonald's. The economists have a concept of the reservation wage you know, wages and conditions, you know, a level below which you simply won't accept right. employment. Now, if SSDI did not exist, some of these men would be compelled to work 30 hours a week in McDonald's. I'll grant you that. Now, how do we parse out that example? <laughs> is that, you know, is it a terrible thing that they are abusing the SSDI program rather than doing that, and how terrible is that? Well, let me let me give you a counter a counter example. Let's say it's a thought experiment. Um, let's say we ha leave uh, leave the entitlements for the elderly aside, and let's look just at the means tested uh, benefits now. Let's say we have entire, and, and this also gets to your question earlier on, I think, about what's, you know, what's the driving force here. And I think it's really quite complicated, or, or subtle, I guess I should say. Um, let's say we have the, uh, the whole set of programs, the panoply for uh, low income uh, support in place, and we get in a time machine, and we take it back to Salem, Massachusetts in, uh, let's say, 1670. Um, would we expect that 35% of the population of Salem, Mass, would avail themselves of the access to means-tested benefits and get the same sort of proportion as we have now? I kind of don't think so. I mean, of course you can't tell because we can never do the experiment. But I think that uh, I think there would have been much more compunction back then to uh, much more stigma, I guess, uh, which would keep people from availing themselves of that. I think we've had a real we've had a change in outlook and a change in mentality, which has been part of the dynamic and. You know, Politics responds to things as well as uh, I, look. I I agree with that, and then it's a question of understanding that change of mentality in its totality, yeah. uh, and trying to do the moral the moral sums. Let me give you an example. Uh, of course, there was no such thing as Medicaid in Salem, Massachusetts right. during that period. Right. And quite frankly, if it exist, if it had existed, it would have done anybody very much good, yeah, right? Would they would have killed killed you faster. Well, this gets you know, so this gets back to the previous point that we were discussing, namely, 
you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be, make a Marxist-based superstructure argument about cultural changes, but why not? It's the new school, after all. <laughs> uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, fact of the, the fact of the matter is that the expectations of all Americans, including poor Americans, about health care have been transformed not just because our moral conceptions of sturdy independence have changed, but because the very nature of healthcare has changed in those three centuries. And such that to be so poor as not to be able to avail yourself of healthcare is a much more substantial deprivation now than it was three centuries ago. Yes. And our society has responded to that fact, in my judgment, completely appropriately. And but maybe we ought to stop the colloquy there. Yeah, why don't, uh, uh, actually, I, I did want to just throw one more thing out, which is a very naive question, but I, I was going to ask Nick, t to what extent, I mean, you put up the slide about um, the percentage of households that are receiving benefit, uh, entitlements yeah. of some sort. What connection is there between that and Mitt Romney's claim that, that we have 47% of the population is dependent? Um, it's, uh, there's, there's no connection. I mean, that's, that's uh, something that came out of a completely different, uh, I suppose, set of calculations or whatever. It, Although it, I would point out that it was the president of Nick's institution, the American Enterprise Institute, who had the fatal conversation with Mitt Romney that produced that 47 percent. Guilt by association. <laughs> Mitt didn't understand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In, in, my, in my book, I, uh, I, I understand. Make, <laughs> I, I, I make the point in here. Uh, that almost all Americans pay taxes. And if it's not income taxes, it's payroll taxes, it's sales taxes. I mean, everybody pays taxes. Yes, sure do. Okay, well that's a real point of conflict, uh, Brookings versus AEI. So let's, uh, uh, let's uh, take any questions from the audience that people have. Sure. Do we have a mic? Yeah, why don't you come on up? Uh, or we can do it and hand it to you, right? That's all right, go ahead. Yeah, this is Prabhakaran, an alumnus of New School. Um, Dr. Eberstadt's presentation, the Tea Party crowd, more than Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan, they will find it very heartwarming. I don't know how much uh, you are conscientiously, uh, how much commitment personally you have to whatever you said. Let me take the entire entitlements, Medicare, um, Social Security, and Medicaid. The first two are really entitlement. They are entitled to it, be entitled to them because they paid for that. The last one is a handout, at Medicaid. So, strictly speaking, it is entitlement only in the sense that every government has a social responsibility, moral responsibility to uh, help the less fortunate in society. In that sense, it is an entitlement, otherwise it's a handout. Now, this, this um, what is the solution? In the last section, that Medicaid, there is a lot of gaming taking place. The game, gaming the system, you said. That has to be addressed, certainly. But uh, the resources the government is losing because of that gaming in this uh, Medicaid portion is negligible compared with the gaming that is taking place in the top 1% uh, in the Wall Street crowd and other. That is the huge loss for the government because of that gaming. So this one, even if we tolerate that, it's okay. Now, the last point I want to make is, uh, you said to one for every one dollar that is spent, that is given to entitlement, three dollars are spent on defense, something like that? Other way around. Three dollars Other way around. Ah, yeah, that's, I'm sorry, very sorry. That's a point I'm trying to make. What the solution? The other way around, we, how many, how many more nuclear bombs we need to destroy this world? And also... Do, do you have a question? Or? Question is, okay. defense can be made very efficient um, by uh, improving the system. For example, the drone is doing an excellent job and a fraction of what we would be spending by deploying troops. The, Drone is doing the job. Anyway, just the thought that I want to share okay. with you. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, yeah. So my question sort of has to do with um, what's happened with employment outside of the home, especially since you both seem to agree that work inside the home that that's unpaid, like you're not taking that into consideration. But I'm. I've been in the anti-hunger and anti-poverty movement like 25 years ago 
we were talking about trying to just not just raise public assistance benefits, but raise the minimum wage. And we've seen now that people, you know, wages have been depressed, hours are being depressed. Uh, you know, the, the person getting a 30 hour a week job at McDonald's is going to be eligible for food stamps, so they're going to be, you know, still dependent. And then the second thing, the second part of the, that still relates, I now work for a Center for Independence for the Disabled a couple of blocks away. And um, so we find that um, people with disabilities, which actually it's, it has been very hard to, for people to get disability, but because you have to have medical evidence, but of course, a 50 year old with good health coverage in the past probably has it, but that there's a, there's a very high rate of unemployment for people with disabilities, and this is due to the fact that employers discriminate against people with disabilities, they discriminate on the basis of age, and they may in fact be able to hire women at 72 cents on the dollar, maybe that's why uh, you're seeing that there's more women in the labor force and maybe not some men, because the employers would rather hire the cheaper ones. So how does, how does that work, the, the employers, with this whole analysis? Well, uh, that's, that's a good question. And let me take some, though not all, of the pieces, because you put a lot on the table. First of all, I have long believed uh, that we ought to raise the minimum wage back to roughly where it was in real terms before it began its steep decline and then index it for inflation so that we never end up in this situation again. Uh, and so instead, we have chosen to supplement it with the earned income tax credit. Uh, and it's not, and, and so to some extent, income available to people in this earning category will not go up dollar for dollar if and when we raise and then index the minimum wage because some of the earned income tax credit payments will go down almost, almost commensurately. We made a choice, and I'm not sure it was the right choice, I'm not sure it was the wrong choice, in effect to socialize, to socialize the, you know, the costs of low wage labor through the EITC as, oppo as, as opposed to the, the minimum wage. Uh, with regard, you know, with regard not only to people with disabilities but also, also women, I think that there's a compelling moral argument as well as economic argument as well as social argument to enforce anti-discrimination laws to the hilt in the area of employment and to the extent that at least a piece of this problem can be addressed through the more effective enforcement of anti-discrimination laws you know, I wholeheartedly agree with you, and I'm not sure there's anybody in this room who disagrees with you. Uh, and, um, you know, so, you know, I, my fear, however, that even, is that even if we did everything you recommend, that some of the, some substantial portion of the problem that we've been discussing and debating for the past hour and a half would still be with us, and we need to think much more boldly about how to address it. Good evening, and thank you for your, your thoughts, your ideas. I'm, my name is Winthrop Thies. I'm a member of the Institute for Retired Professionals here at the New School. And you talk about social insurance in the 30s, some 60 years after Chancellor Bismarck did it in Germany, and 30 years after Lloyd George and, and Churchill in the United Kingdom laid the foundations for the UK's uh, welfare plan. When you talk of social, social insurance, we often talk about the safety net. We don't want people falling through the safety net. But then we have these plans. I think Social Security is probably not a problem. We all know we can tweak that a little, you know, maybe move up the uh, retirement age or benefits or whatever. But the real problem is Medicare. And that's because of the increased costs, of medical technology, and the, just the inflationary effects of going up so much more than normal inflation. That's the thing that threatens to bankrupt us. So how about making this explicitly social insurance? And uh, Dr. Goldston 
mentioned the analogy with the actuarial benefits, and he mentioned, you know, homeowner's insurance against fire and storm. Why don't we convert, certainly Medicare and probably Social Security too, and we'll call it lifestyle insurance, <laughs> so that people, if they, if they have a need for it, in other words, we're really means testing it, if they have a need for it, they get benefits. If, if your house doesn't burn down, you don't get payments under your insurance, and the insurance isn't lost. So why don't we explicitly make it social insurance, and don't pay it to uh, Warren Buffett, and George Soros, and Jamie Dimon. They don't need it. Uh, the, the logic of that seems compelling. I think, by the way, if you did that, you might be able to do away with the employer contribution, the matching contribution. And since everybody, all economists I know of, agree that the federal corporate income tax rate is far too high, even the president says so, this would in effect reduce the impact on corporations, increase their cash flow, allow them to invest and hire more people. What do you think of that idea? Well, I have ideas about that idea that I think you'll like, but since I've been talking a lot, why don't I toss it to Nick first? And if he doesn't say what I'm going to say, then I'll come back in. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to just amend uh, Bill's conception of uh, social insurance as home insurance. To uh, elaborate on that analogy just one little bit, our social insurance programs are like home insurance programs now if you are going to pay for the home of the next owner. See, because we're in a pay-as-you-go system, you're not paying for yourself, you're paying for another generation. And this adds, this adds a layer of complexity, I think. Um, it, it, get, it gets again to the uh, kind of the, um, uh, the public choice, uh, the other people's money aspect of the problem there. Um, Bill has put his finger on the technological aspect of the healthcare problem. Uh, there is the demographic aspect there as well. Um, more broadly, I guess in this book, I'm talking about the whole question of entitlements, you know, entitlements paid out of other people's money and the extent to which this makes for problems in our society, you know, moral and social problems in our society. In, th in this study, I don't offer a single proposal for reform for anything. You know, I don't, I mean, Bill is much better at this than I am. I don't have a, I don't have a 10 uh, point plan and I don't have a 12 step program. I mean, I, the first step in the 12 step program is recognizing that you've got a problem. <laughs> recognizing we have a problem I think is the right place to begin the conversation. But Bill, you've got more developed thoughts about Well, this. maybe, but let me give you, you know, you know, very good question. Let me give you a very personal answer, okay, which also has social ramifications. God knows my wife and I aren't rich, but you know, we've both been college professors and I'm now the moral equivalent of a college professor. Uh, and uh, as a result, I'm pretty confident that when we retire, we'll be able to turn our TIAA CREF contributions into inflation protected annuities that put together will guarantee us a six-figure retirement income as long as we live. For people like us, the value of Medicare should be confined to what the healthcare experts call guaranteed issue. The fact that when you show up and say, I'm at the appropriate age, I want to be insured under Medicare, you cannot be turned away not for pre-existing conditions, not for anything. It's sort of like Robert Frost's famous definition of home. And, uh, you know, and what that means is that if, uh, let's then add up the actuarial value of all of the contributions that my wife and I have made to Medicare in the course of our working lives, 
If we are going to be drawing more from the Medicare program than the actual variables, actuarial values of those contributions, then that difference ought to be made up by higher premiums that people like us pay into the system so that we are not drawing anything from, to use Nick's phrase, other people's money, right? We are drawing on our own resources to pay our fair share of a, the costs of a health insurance program that guarantees us health security. That's the point. Not a subsidy, health security. And if you combined that principle with the principle that Medicare and social insurance in general ought not to pay for the equivalent of a coat of paint on your house, then we will have taken some important steps towards rebalancing the system in ways that I think that people on reflection would find acceptable. Thank you. Next. First of all, I'd like to thank both of you for a very important um, contribution to this, this debate, which obviously does have huge implications around the world, not just in this country. But I wonder if I might uh, suggest perhaps um, broadening the discussion a little bit particularly with respect to health care, and to think about the distinction between the ostensible and the actual beneficiaries of health care entitlements. Because it seems to me that if we really look, and I, I know Nick had a chart where he talked, where he showed improvements in the health status of, 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 of working Americans, but relative to its, the amount that the United States spends as a share of GDP, the health status of Americans is to the middle of the pack, if not the bottom, in terms of national rankings. And I think that that suggests a very important point, which is that the real beneficiary of all of this health care entitlement spending has not been the people on whose ostensible behalf it's been spent. It's been the medical establishment. It's been the pharmaceutical industry. Atul Gawande, in his series of articles in The New Yorker in recent months, some of which were actually cited by the president and recommended by the president for his, his staff to read, talks about the venalization of the medical profession and how unnecessary surgery, 50% of bypass operations in this country are unnecessary, we just don't happen to know which half, unnecessary treatments for prostate cancer, the regrettable set of... Uh, of, of, of um, attitudes about uh, mammographies, et cetera, et cetera, have led people to believe that their health status is positively correlated with the consumption of medical services when, in fact, the opposite is far more likely to be the case. And unless and until that deception, or what Kant called a subreption, is corrected, I think that inexorable trend towards higher health care spending is really not going to be reversed. So I think we need to broaden this discussion and really get out who's really benefiting from this rather than who thinks they may be benefiting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that comment. Uh, I'll just make one observation there. Uh, I never thought that I would live so long as to see America's health level lower than East Germany's. I never thought I would live to see, to see that happen. And at this point in time, Eastern Germany's life expectancy is three years higher than America's. I never thought that was going to happen in my lifetime. Right, whether that's a function of the healthcare system or something else is, is you know. It's different things. It, it's, it, it's different things. Well, first of all, you know, I want to agree in part and disagree in part. Uh, I absolutely agree with the proposition uh, that venality has overtaken what used to be a very honorable and restrained profession, uh, and that you know, and, and that doing something aggressively about that is a very, very important step to take. Absolutely, where I think I disagree in part with you is the argument that because of that, you know, that stratum of venality, it follows that the recipients of these programs have not benefited from them. They have. And the, you know, the challenge for public policy, and it's a real challenge, is to, you know, is to change incentives and change program structures in a way that enable the very real beneficiaries of these programs to benefit 
as close to 100% as possible from the public investments that are needed to support these programs. Let me give you an example, you know, another, another, personal, another personal example. Uh, in the last five years of my late parents' life, both of them ended up needing nursing home care. In my mother's case, for more than four years. In my father's case, thank God, for only, for only, for only six months. Now, they were able to finance those very costly expenditures out of their own savings, but 90% of Americans couldn't. And that is why so much of nursing home care is financed through the Medicaid program. Now, it may be that there are efficiencies in nursing home care, although it is an inherently labor-intensive process and therefore inherently, you know, in inherently cost-intensive. It's the sort of thing where technological change is really not going to make the kind of difference that it might in other, in other sectors of healthcare. And there, the aging of our society, you know, coupled with our inability so far to come up with persuasive responses to problems such as Alzheimer's disease and broader speaking dementia, I think will guarantee not only continued upward pressure on the needs, but but very important benefits flowing to actual human beings. I, I know doctors are actual human beings, but you know, bear with me. You know, and, and you know, and so I think that I think I think that we have to re, we have to resist the kind of simplification of the problem that makes it easier to deal with you know emotionally. Uh, if the problem were simply the abusers, the bad guys, well then, we can say, you know, a morally grounded, you know, intervention uh, is, is all we need. But it's more complicated than that. And just once more on a personal note, uh, I'm a prostate cancer survivor. And it is possible that the treatment that I selected was unnecessary, but nobody knew that. I didn't know that, and the doctors didn't know that. And so if you ask me, was I comfortable just sitting there with it, watchful waiting is what's known in the trade, and hoping that I'd be one of the majority of men for whom it never developed any, any, into anything worse, was I willing to take that chance? The answer is somewhere between no and hell no, and most people agree with me, right? And so. I think it's you know I think it's not right to use statistics about unnecessary care to invite men to play Russian roulette with their bodies because I'm certainly not willing to. Right. So what do you do? What do you do? You know, it's unnecessary. Let us say for 50 percent of the population. Yeah. Well. Right. But but I think that health care is made up of an iteration of these personal experiences and personal choices. It's not simply an arithmetic aggregate. And we have to pay attention, it seems to me, to the well, real choice calculus of the human beings involved. Is the problem that we give choice in healthcare, and, and, and whereas in many other systems, it's more, you know, it's a standardized, um, your choices, many of your choices are made for you. Well, look, you know, the Brits have a much more restrictive system, right. and what that means is that if you're past a certain age, you can't get hip replacements and knee, replace, and knee replacements. There are all sorts of things you can't get, and I guarantee you that what you can't get under the British system diminishes life expectancy in Britain. That's just a fact. Now, as a social choice, as a social choice, it diminishes not only life expectancy but quality of life. Quite right now. Is that a defensible social choice? It may well be, but we have to, we have to do full balance sheet accounting of the, of, the, of the costs as well as the benefits of that kind of restriction. Okay. Um, I'm sure the three of you are sick of hearing this already, but uh, thanks so much for coming. This has, been, this has been great, very informative. Oh, you keep saying that all night long. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in case anyone's wondering why I come bearing all this, this wonderful technology, I'm currently working on an article for um, Young Entrepreneur magazine. Um, 
It's about one of um, my son's favorite publications, by the way. Oh yeah, he's a B school student. So <laughs> thank you for that. Is he a young entrepreneur too? Yeah. Well, um, I've one thing. I so do you mind if I um, record this and quote you on it in the article? Sure. Okay, helping out a young reporter. I, that's very admirable. Um, <laughs> This is you know, it's all public. This is all on the record, so you don't even have to ask. <laughs> yeah. Nothing just, secret I was about this. Just making sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so one thing I've noticed about you know, the campaign and just about the political discourse in general is that it tends to focus on issues that appeal more to older voters, um, whether it be social issues or you know, having to do with entitlements. Um, you don't hear a lot about, you know, as much about college grants, and the, you know, they'll drop in token references, but there's not as much about that. So, my question, since this is for a, mag a magazine that focuses <laughs> on entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. is you both you both agree that entitlement spending is, if not unsustainable, then undesirable. So, what what will the consequences of this spending be for? Um, millennial entrepreneurs, you know, those who are just starting out now, and how will it affect the economy as they progress in their careers, and how will it affect their business prospects, and what will the country look like when, you know, when millennials take the rein, the take the reins? And I have one follow-up after this if there's time, but, yeah. Well, just, just one tiny part of this, I think that Bill having an entrepreneur for a son probably is much more steeped in this. One thing which we can see right now, uh, and this is going to, I think, affect uh, millennials quite directly, is that the uh, rising tide of uh, entitlements is killing the middle class. I mean, we hear about all sorts of different pressures on the middle class today, and those pressures are very real. Let me tell you about one that you may not have considered quite as much. Um, in the latest Pew uh, research uh, study on the, well, the plight of the middle class, uh, the survey suggested that a, a really big increase in Americans no longer see themselves as being part of our middle class. I mean, some of them see themselves as being upper class, but. Uh, 32 or 33 percent see themselves as being lower class. I think it was called lower class. Um, by strange coincidence, 35 percent of Americans now are accepting means-tested benefits. Now, is it possible for people to see themselves as being middle class when they are applying for and accepting means-tested benefits? The proportion of Americans accepting means-tested benefits is about twice as high as it was 30 years ago. Um, times are pretty awful right now, but I don't think that America is twice as poor as it was 30 years ago. So to the extent that, uh, to the extent that we see an increasing proportion of Americans in this part of the entitlement arena, I think it's going to have an important self-conception on people as they look out towards their future. Uh, um, sorry to be an annoying, yeah. Yeah. badgering yeah. reporter, yeah. Yeah. but could you could you talk specifically about how it would um, you know, maybe sure. affect the prospects of entrepreneurs? Uh, well, entrepre entrepreneurs, young, entre yeah. like entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs are, may yeah. always be a small fraction of any society. Right. I mean, I mean, entrepreneurs are uh, are usually a small fraction of any, but it is going to change. It is going to change the conception or the self conception of the generation as it uh, as it progresses through the life cycle. If people see themselves as naturally being part of the of that aspect, I think of the entitlement universe. Right. Let me give you let me give you a very different kind of answer. And that is that, you know, right now, I just had a conversation with my son about this, you know, uh, six, six hours ago. And he, and he tells me, you know, he's very interested in venture capital, particularly early stage venture capital, the sort of venture capital that supports people like you, right? 
startups and you know immediate post startup phase and right now there is an enormous amount of investment capital he says chasing a relatively you know modest number of really good new ideas but as these programs progressively grow and consume more of the national income over time there will be less investment capital available that's just a matter of simple arithmetic you know, investment capital is part of what's left over after you net out all of all of these programs, and and investment capital is the lifeblood of entrepreneurship. So, not today, not tomorrow, not next year, not five years from now, but a generation from now, the diminution of investment capital will have, I think, a depressing effect on on entre on entrepreneurship. Right. And okay. Very, very brief follow-up, if you don't mind. Because we're right at the end of our time. Yeah, so. I'm sorry. If you could, if this one is probably like you could answer in a sentence. Why do you think it is that, despite this fact that you know this is really going to affect young people? You know, I mean, you know, no offense, but most people in this room will probably be gone before we we hit that <laughs> we hit that fiscal <laughs> that fiscal cliff. So why is it that young people, you know, are so disengaged in the political process when this issue they of entitlements should be... Of they should be out there voting. Importance. I mean, I think exactly. that's... A, that's well, the, look, uh, that's a very good question, and, uh, you know, I'll give you, you know, as a political scientist, this is something I've studied, and I'll give you just a very partial answer. It has always been the case that voting participation is strongly dependent on the phase of the life cycle, exactly. right? As you, know, as you get full-time employment, get married, uh, have responsibilities, your perception of the interaction of your well-being here and now with social policy and with government increases dramatically and that is a major spur, the spur of immediate personal and familial self-interest for, for involvement. And so the fact that young adults are relatively disconnected from social commitments, from marriage, from children, to jobs that they consider to be not just the overture until the curtain goes up on the first act, but actually the first act, all of those things contribute to downward pressure on political participation. And then something else is going on. And I say this as a lifelong Democrat, Young people were given reason to expect an enormous amount four years ago. And I talk to young adults where I work at Brookings every day, and the same adjective comes up over and over again, disappointed. Right? That's the median response to the past four years. And that's making it very difficult for young adults to feel as passionate about politics as they did four years ago. Now, having said that, the way they felt four years ago was very much the exception. Mm -hmm. And you would echo that? Or? Absolutely. I mean, I think Bill is entirely correct that one of the findings in political science, in public opinion polls and everything else, is that uh, younger people almost always have lower participation rates than older people. I mean, it goes, it didn't start with your generation. Right. <laughs> it was true of my generation. Okay. So, and, and 2008 really was an unusual, uh, was an unusual right. blip. There. And more importantly, who do you want to win the World Series? No, okay. no, 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 no. Now you're really, that's <laughs> You've already had two bites of the <laughs> apple. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, how you doing? I'll keep this very brief again. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, the precision and depth of your analysis is uh, useful to us all. Uh, being a millennial myself, I kind of reject some of the characterizations that the last gentleman made. And <laughs> actually, as a, as a millennial, it, it kind of informs my question. A couple of gentlemen, uh, a couple of speakers ago, there was a question about expanding the scope of, of the debate. And some of my friends and I at NSSR seek to do that when we think about entitlements in, our, uh, in the late hours of the night when we're not worried about school. and, and so my question really is, why is it that we're stuck in this idea? Why are we stuck in a frame where entitlements, particularly Medicare and Social Security, are, this, are the bounds of what entitlements can mean in the future, especially if actuarial, uh, actuarially uh, Medicare seems to be 
uh, unstable. W is it, would it be possible, in your perspective, to uh, move towards a Medicare system like what you described, something that was more like catastrophic care, and then push what we consider to be entitlements closer to uh, some sort of guaranteed income like they were pr proposing in the 70s and the 40s? Or, uh, I, I, I don't know, other programs like that, something that, like, guaranteed college, or, 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 or have that be what entitlement means in America, as opposed to Social Security and Medicare. I might not have articulated that question no, yeah. as well as possible, but I think that it... Well, look, you articulated it just fine, and I'll answer you in one or two sentences. You know, is a guaranteed annual income a left-wing idea or a right-wing idea? In, you know, in, in American history, it has been both. And, you know, and some contemporary thinkers on both the left and the right have made you know, exactly your argument. Namely, instead of all of these programs, why don't we cash a lot of them out and turn them into a sort of a basic guarantee and take it from there? I'm not sure I support that, but I sure support thinking a lot harder about that than we have. I, I hope that uh, I hope that if we've made any contribution this evening, we'll stimulate you and friends and colleagues to think about the sorts of things which are actually workable and sustainable alternatives to our current uh, entitlement problem. Um, we also we haven't mentioned this evening much about voluntary charities, and the United States has got a really unique heritage of a strong and rich civil society. That's presumably going to be part of the answer somewhere along there. Um, I'm, I think, more uh, attentive or worried about the dependence problem and the extent to which this leads to a need for justification for taking and to resentment politics than Bill is. I think he's, um, he's made a very powerful argument for his uh, point of view. Um, at the end of the day, I guess I feel kind of about entitlements the way that Bill Clinton uh, felt about abortion. I'd like to see them as being safe, legal, and rare. But there are probably other ways that one could go forward with this also. And I know that I mean, we don't offer any solutions in here. I think we want to get people to think about solutions that they can work and you know, make to last. Well, I think it's uh, fair to say that you've both made us think uh, quite a bit about this, and that's a very positive thing. So thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Please come back to the New School. There are plenty of events all the time. So.